Yeah, um, I'll start us off shortly. All right, I'm going to just get our rules up. I have been mentioning them um, a few times, but please note, everyone who is now coming into the into the webinar, that uh, as a setting, we have turned your microphone off, and we want you to leave it off. Um, also, your video cams have been turned off simply to preserve bandwidth so that everyone can get a seamless experience. Normally, in smaller groups, we would advocate that you keep the video cams on. We think it's very important that you, as a presenter, you can see all your participants. But today is special because it's a very large group and uh, therefore we've asked you to keep them off. However, we do want to hear from you. So if you have a question during the webinar, please can you put it into the chat facility? Can you spend a few moments now just checking that you know where the chat facility is? We have two people dedicated to trying to go through as many of your questions as possible, and they will try and answer you in the chat. Uh, and some of them they will pass on to me. I'm the facilitator today, and I will then try and answer them in front of everyone so everyone can benefit from the insights. Um, all right, it is now 12 o'clock, and we are going to kick off. I am going to ask our host today, uh, Ndomo Dranini from AAU, to give us uh, a welcome and let us know how this fits into their vision. Over to you. Okay, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. I'm bringing you greetings from Accra, Ghana, from the Association of African Universities particularly the Secretary General, Professor Etienne Ehile. We are very excited to be hosting this very important webinar as one of our responses to supporting academic staff in Africa to be able to cope in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. There are a number of initiatives that we have as an association to support uh, universities. And I invite you to look at our website, aau.org, and particularly visit the page called COVID-19 within the Association of African Universities website. Um, we are excited, obviously, that uh, we got a very good response in, in, in terms of registrations, and we invite you not to forget the other follow-up webinars that are coming after this one. There's a follow-up webinar on the 30th of April, another one on the 4th of May, and another one on the 8th of May, still on the same subject, supporting academic staff to do their business during the lockdowns. So you are all welcome, and uh, I hope we will all have a successful uh, session of learning. Thank you, Andrew. I hand over to you. Oh, thank you very much for that. That's great. All right. Um, today's team, we've got a, a number of people trying to support you. Um, this is obviously an AAU initiative, and we're very thankful for them to getting, getting this thing going. Uh, my name is Andrew Moore. Uh, I am representing OER Africa today, and um, I've been very fortunate in the past to uh, be involved very much with online learning, and therefore I'm hoping that some of the expertise that I have come across and assimilated myself can be imparted to you. Um, also working in the, uh, as part of the team, we've got Neil Butcher. Neil Butcher is also representing OER Africa today. Uh, he is a co-project director at OER Africa, and he's going to be doing a very valuable job of the back channel manager today. Because the group is so large, we need some hands to help us process all your queries and so on. So Neil will be looking after that. And supporting him is Kathy. Kathy is also representing OER Africa today. And um, yes, one of those two will be responding to you in the chat facility. 
So once again, please notice that we have muted your mics. We wanted to stay that way. We have turned your cams off and um, we would like you to ask your questions through the chat facility. So uh, that's going to be our protocol for today. So if you want to be heard, please raise your questions in the chat. All right. So what are we here for? So the design of this webinar series is really an attempt to provide you with quick and cheap solutions to suddenly now having to teach online. And uh, we call that ERT, Emergency Remote Teaching. And if you go on the internet and have a look around, you'll see there's quite a distinction between ERT and what others are calling online learning. Obviously, they're related but they are slightly different in the sense that ERT has to be picked up quickly and we need to provide quick, simple solutions to uh, having to engage your students uh, in a completely different way to what we're normally used to. All right, so to do that, we've got four webinars. The first one is a more of an overview. We're gonna show you some, um, uh, some ways to teach effectively. In fact, we're gonna keep it really simple because in the end, ERT is not a magic thing. It is really straightforward, simple, and any of you can pick it up and implement it in an effective way with a little bit of briefing, a little bit of creativity, and um, uh, a bit of experience. And this is the time to try it out. So today's one is more of an overview. We're gonna show you some of the principles. Uh, and we're also going to spend a bit of time in PowerPoints, just showing you how you can sexy up your PowerPoints so that they are more engaging, that they respond to an ERT environment rather than perhaps as lecture notes. And yeah, so there's going to be some principles, but there's also going to be some hands on new technical skills um, uh, there. If you find that this takes, if you enjoy this, then on Thursday, we've got another one, right? and it's much more. Um, more about the process. So what to teach during campus closure? There's no doubting that some of the uh, materials that we try to teach in ERT are better suited to online or the online environment. And we'll show you how to go through your curriculum and actually pick out the pieces which will most likely be successful. And for those more difficult ones, we can give you some ideas about how you might do it. Uh, the third one, uh, next Monday, is knowing if learning is happening during campus closure. Normally when we're in front of our lectures, uh, we're lecturing and we're in front of the students, then uh, we get a lot of nonverbal communication as to how well this is going down and whether the students are actually picking it up, especially with tutorials and later on with practical sessions. But of course that's gone now. So how do you know that learning is happening when uh, students are learning remotely? And we'll show you some tricks in, uh, to do that. And the fourth one will be a um, uh, week on Friday. Communicate effectively during campus closure. We're gonna show you the uh, tips and tricks. How do you make sure that you're still engaged with your students, that they know you're there, that you care, and that uh, you want them to do the best they can under these trying circumstances. So that's the fourth one. All right. So let's have a look at today's agenda. Very quickly, we're just gonna pick out four principles which we think if you can implement these, you are away, up and away. And luckily, none of these are brain surgery. It's really easy. But um, just a little bit of thought, a little bit of creativity, and you can do this. So we're gonna talk about quickly, uh, what, uh, what materials should you select? And what are the principles in, select, in selecting these materials? Then we're gonna ask you to think about how you can contextualize the study so that it, it becomes more meaningful, more relevant, more engaging for the students. We want you to also think, what must the students do with your materials that would uh, uh, allow them to be more than just passive learners? And then we're gonna ask you to provide feedback and support. So we'll give you some tips and tricks about how you can do that very easily um, as you're going along. Uh, then we're also going to have a little section called the tips and tricks section. We're gonna look at PowerPoint and we're gonna show you four things. Some of them are very easy, like how do you use insert graphics? How can you use open educational resources, images and photos, etc., online in your PowerPoint? We're also going to have a look at 
uh, YouTube videos. How can you insert YouTube videos into your materials? How can you put your own voice in so you can actually uh, have a voiceover where you uh, can talk to the points in your PowerPoint? And if you want to, you can even put a screen capture video uh, into your PowerPoint. PowerPoint has the ability for you to capture things on your screen and put them in. So we're going to look at that too. All right. Um, oh, yes. Before you really get started, the webinar one resources, everything you see in this um, tutorial. In fact, because we're representing OER Africa, all the resources are openly licensed and you can take them and use them and adapt them um, and uh, not just what, not just this presentation, but the other resources that we have identified, you can access all of them in our webinar classroom. So we've built a Google classroom and um, there's the link on the screen at the moment. It's very simple, classroom.google.com. When you go in, it'll ask you for the code. So please can you have a look at that code there, make a note, and I'll show you again at the end so that you can uh, access all of the resources and there's lots and it, the classroom will use it not just for today's webinar or for webinar all the resources will be in the classroom so you can get hold of them all right so that's the prep and now let's begin our webinar in all seriousness again any questions please use the chat facility to raise your concerns or have some queries or answered So, what are the essential elements of emergency remote teaching? And we would argue that one of the things you really need to be careful about is what is it that you give to the students in terms of their materials and activities during this time? Traditionally, we've often thought that, uh, oh, 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 we'll give them this reading, or oh, oh, this is a new reading, we'll add that onto the list. And uh, as higher education institutions, it's important that our students are exposed to the full gamut of academic debates within our areas. But for emergency remote teaching, it's a bit different. The students are isolated. They are probably on a, on a not great uh, con connection to the materials. Um, they are feeling vulnerable and therefore we don't want to overwhelm them. We really want them to be, uh, see only the really important materials, the key materials, the core stuff. And therefore our, my first point today is that when you are making your selections of your materials and your activities, they must all be essential content only. This is not a case to show them the bibliography of your, of your whole course. This is where you need to hand pick carefully what is key, what is core, what is essential. This is an instance where less is more. So uh, when you uh, start putting together your ERT program, keep that in mind. Keep things really down to the bare bones. The second item I would say then is the materials shouldn't be too long. So that yes, they must be core, but we should also think, is it possible to edit them down to uh, their key messages? So we often say that in, in instructional design, we often mention the ability to chunk information. And this is based on cognitive science uh, findings where short-term memory um, is, is kind of limited and therefore, we can only process so much information at, uh, in a relatively short time. So we would argue then that your materials should be concise and that if possible, you should chunk them into small segments. Um, one of the things I've noticed is that some lecturers are putting up videos of their lecture and they put the whole two hour lecture up. I mean, that's, that's kind of a killer for online remote learning. Um, I would say you should chop your your video of your lecture or any other video that you create into small chunks around about 10 15 minutes max i mean if you think of these ted talks for example they try and keep them between 8 and 15 minutes so the idea then is uh, 
uh, whether it's video or whether it's text or whatever, try and keep it down to small, manageable chunks. And then we would also argue while you're selecting your materials, try and go for a variety of different types of formats. So as lecturers, we've, we often bemoan that our students just don't read anymore, that this generation aren't great readers, and yet a skill for their profession that they will need in the future is to be able to process lots of readings and articles and journal um, re research and so on. And yes, I would say normally this is something we should champion, but during ERT, I would say it's now important to start thinking about other ways to present the information if possible, or just give them a mix of different formats. So yes, give them some text, but then also try and think about, can we use video? Can we use audio? Are there some simulations? Um, is there perhaps a podcast or an audio file that we could um, use to break up the, um, the different types of formats? And this is backed by research as well. So um, if you think of garden as multiple intelligences, whether you like that theory or not, basically it does say that many of us have different preferences in terms of how we learn in terms of the format. So yes, that's kind of backed up by research too. Um, the, oh, sorry, I'm just checking my notes. My back channel's talking to me. No, no, not yet. All right, and then the fourth item is, we, ideally we don't want to fall into any uh, copyright problems uh, also. So um, maybe it's a good idea, in fact, it is a good idea to make sure that we use as many open educational resources as possible. Now, obviously we are OER Africa, that's our mandate is to encourage uh, African academics to start using OER, but also to release their own materials as OER. And so you're going to see throughout the presentation, I'm going to be offering you other people's OER to back up what I'm saying, but your materials too, for your students. We would strongly encourage you to think about uh, giving them resources where there are no copyright restrictions or problems. So materials should have no barriers to, to access. Okay, so that was a ramble. But um, I would say that ideally, the, um, ideally you should look at these resources. Um, ideally, you should download the, the PowerPoint at the end of the presentation and go through. There's all these links here. These are some open education resources to do with what I'm talking about. So there you'll notice the first one there is a little tutorial, how to find open content. And you can click on the little access button and it'll take you directly there. And you can go through a tutorial about how to do OER. Um, the second one is more about how to chunk your materials. So I was talking about chunking earlier. So there's a little YouTube video, which will take you through the uh, process of chunking your material. And I also mentioned Gardner. So do you want to know a little bit more about him? If you do, here's an article which explains his multiple intelligence theory and his um, advice that we should offer multiple different ways to, to deliver the information. You can see the little uh, CC licenses at the bottom. Uh, all of these are OERs. They all allow you to take and use them for free. There, you don't have to ask for permission, um, and all of them allow you to adapt them and reuse them in different ways if you want. Um, so yes, thank you to the open community for some resources there. All right, I wouldn't like to, now that we've had started, I wouldn't mind hearing a little bit about some of your um, perspectives from what I've said. Here is a question to consider. We would like some of you to um, respond in the Zoom and uh, let us know what your answers are. But this is the query, in what ways do you need to adjust the materials you have used previously? So from what I've mentioned earlier, are you in a position whereby you can now release these in this new format? Or are you kind of stuck with handwritten um, lecture notes? Um, in your minds, have a think about that. You can respond in the Zoom, 
But for those of you who have already accessed the classroom, then I have also put in a discussion forum in there. So you could also um, uh, provide your answers to that query in the discussion forum in the classroom. I am going to pause just briefly while you have an opportunity to think about that question and also to post your response in the chat or the classroom discussion forum. So Andrew, unfortunately, yep. um, the chat fac facility has been somewhat compromised. Yes. Um, so we've been Zoom bombed, which I've read about and was hoping wouldn't happen to us. Uh, that means that I've had to switch the chat off because we're getting some really very abusive messages coming through the chat. I'm very sorry, everybody, about that. Um, I, I thought that switching it off is probably the best solution under the circumstances. I hope you'll all understand. Um, and I'm not sure if we can possibly, uh, we'll try and think of a different way to add uh, questions. I, I will um, share via email my Skype address. Uh, and so if you have questions, uh, you can post them to Skype. Uh, or alternatively, we could use the chat facility in the Google Classroom, uh, which we will monitor as well. So um, I'm very sorry about that. But uh, so, yeah. So right. if you have uh, a question um, and you have access to the Google Classroom, please post it there. Some people have indicated also that they're struggling with the code. Um, All right, so let's go back up. Yeah, but then just people are saying they've struggled with it, so. All right, let's just, I'll also have a look in the classroom now. I've got this on another computer, where I can have a quick look. Um, but anyway, I think you should continue going in the meantime, Andrew. All right, I can do that. Um, all right, okay, right. So let me get back to where we were. All right, so I went through that quite quickly. So what happens if you want to know more detail or you actually want to get the skills to do that? So this is a plug for our second webinar on Thursday. Hopefully we'll have sorted out some of our um, uh, communication tools, but the content of the webinar two will be how to, uh, we will investigate how to select specific parts of the curriculum that are suited to ERT. And then we will discuss um, how to identify resources and choose digital tools to support remote teaching. So we'll go into a lot more detail. Today I was at a very high level. I just gave you four principles that you should think about, but we will go and unpack that so that uh, you might feel ready to, to engage. All right. So, we looked at careful selection of materials, but now we would argue that your next principle or your next essential element is to provide a context for learning. In fact, this would be good in normal teaching anyway, but is especially important for ERT. And um, the, what we're saying here is that learning happens when students understand new information in relation to what they already know or how it relates to prior experience. Again, this comes from educational research. It's very clear now that uh, students very rarely, in fact, almost never learn something purely in isolation. Okay, it's quite rare. What they're normally doing is trying to understand what you're teaching them in terms of their prior knowledge or their past experiences. And therefore we should help them to do this which will make the materials and the course content much more engaging for them. They will see um, why this is significant. What you're trying to teach them is significant. It's interesting. This is especially true for, for males. Um, males, uh, unless they can understand why something is important, the chances of them engaging at a deep level is pretty low. Uh, women are slightly different women will hold judgment for a little while before they'll say, okay, I don't really understand why this is important or significant. So keeping that in mind then, um, the first thing is an easy way to do this 
is to actually set some questions so that when they're engaging with your material, they're not doing it passively. So say, for example, you gave them a reading or a video, and then you said, oh, okay, read the reading or watch the video. Then the problem is it's out of, it has no context. There's no reason for them to feel engaged. So a quick, easy way is to ask them a question first about something that will appear in the video or the reading, and then allow them to read the article, watch the video with a lens to try to answer that question. So that's an easy way to do it, but it is can be superficial, superficial if it's not done well. So you can go a bit deeper, and we would say provide a context whereby you are trying to understand real-world problems that are framed or that can be framed by the theory that you're trying to teach them. So, for example, what's nice about this webinar series is that the real-world problem is very obvious. I mean, it's very rare you get it this, this strong. We are obviously trying to help you get uh, up and running with ERT, uh, obviously because of all the lockdowns throughout the world. But does your content lend itself to something similar? Uh, is it an engineering problem? Is it a health issue? Is it something to do with um, another aspect of a world problem? Poverty, or if you're doing economics, for example. So try and think about how you might do that. Also, educational research tends to suggest that when you start something, a lesson or a, a program, there should be some type of a hook and um, some type of way to engage the students, some way to frame what they're about to do. And um, uh, sometimes it could be an open-ended question. Sometimes it can be a community problem, which the materials might support uh, and so on. So again, find, find a real world problem. See if you can set some questions in front of any resource that you offer. Try and be provocative or um, uh, find a way to engage the students right up, up front. And then if you're really good, then the trick is, can you find an opportunity for the students to transfer what they've learned as theory and apply it to a specific new context? Okay, so that last one would be like first prize if you can get there. Uh, how can you set your little ERT lesson so that it builds towards the students then transferring that knowledge to solve something that's a community issue. All right, so want to know more about these things? So again, we've put together a little package of OERs for you to have a look at in your own time. So the first one is understanding what an open-ended question is. How do you set these questions that I'm talking about? Then there are, there's some principles which will allow you to set good open-ended questions. And then uh, there's a little uh, YouTube video, uh, which has, it looks at the critical role of curiosity and engagement for today's youth in connected learning. And then there's another one about the hook. I was trying to mention, find something engaging or provocative. So starting a lesson with an initial stimulus material could be your hook. So there's a little article that you can read there as well. All of them, again, open educational resources. Which brings us to our third student activity, which is to create, uh, which is to create, sorry, brings us to our third essential element, which is to create student activities. All right. What do we mean by this? One of the big problems with education at the moment is uh, that we probably don't set enough opportunities for the students to be active learners. Uh, our tradition for teaching and learning has been a very passive model where we provide them with the contents and we kind of think, well, that's enough. So during ERT, what we would encourage you to do is to set some type of an activity which forces the students to do something with the material, not just simple recall or comprehension. Ideally, it should be higher order thinking skills where they're being uh, critical or they're ha having to evaluate or they're having to create something would be ideal. Um, so what might these activities be in order to get them to engage with your materials? And 
an easy one for online is whereas previously we had a tutorial, now we uh, could offer them an online debate or a discussion. Um, again, uh, your role or your tutor's role would be to facilitate that discussion without actually answering them, but guiding them through the, the, the discussion. So uh, Google Classroom has a little online discussion forum, but I'm sure if your institution has a learner management system, then they too have normally some type of a forum or a discussion uh, facility. However, it doesn't have to be in an LMS. You could be using uh, social media, like a WhatsApp group, something like that, where you can c collect your group together, your class together. If it's not too big, you can use WhatsApp groups. All right, the second type of activity that we would encourage is um, short, focused assignments. If, if it's something that uh, the materials that you've provided are building blocks to something that's much more complex and they need to go through this, you don't want to give them a big project, but you could give them something short and sharp, perhaps um, to create a little PowerPoint presentation or to um, put together a little word assignment, a word processor document, or perhaps it is to create a poster or perhaps um, uh, in a graphics package. So the idea then something short and focused, which they can do relatively easily online using common productivity tools in order to uh, create evidence that they have engaged with your materials and uh, uh, understand them and can do something with them and ideally transfer that knowledge to something new. All right. So you could also do project work that covers multiple lessons. Sometimes it gets a bit much, all these short, sharp assignments, and you think, no, rather let them build something that's more substantial by hooking together all my ERT lessons. And we're going to show you that later in uh, in webinar two, how to actually sequence your um, your ERT lessons so that you can build sophisticated knowledge sets and um, uh, master specific skill sets. So uh, that's another option. But if you can't think of anything else, then at least give them a short little quiz. And again, we've got um, tools to do this. So if you are in uh, Google Classroom, which we will investigate in more detail in the next webinar, um, or your institutional LMS, or perhaps um, uh, an online free multiple choice tool. We, in fact, we're going to look at that in the third webinar, one, of, one, such, um, one such tool. Okay, my back channel is talking to me. They're telling me I'm getting a bit excited. I got to slow down. <laughs> Uh, I get very excited. You can see I'm get very animated and um, obviously close to my heart. All right. So um, four options then about element number three. What can you do to make sure that your materials aren't received passively? There needs to be, the students need to be active learners. So again, get them to discuss amongst themselves. You can facilitate set short, sharp assignments per article or per lesson, or sequence them into a project that covers multiple of your ERT lessons, or give them a test, give them a short test. Keep in mind that you want the machine to mark it. You don't want to do that. Um, so make sure that it's machine markable. All right, so that is element three. And again, We've identified um, some resources for you to go deeper. Um, our first resource is how to facilitate these online discussions. Uh, as you can see from today, the, just the vast number of, of people in the group um, has um, given us a headache in terms of keeping our communication and our discussion going. So we're going to have to think about that carefully for our next one. But there are also principles about how you should facilitate a online discussion. So we've got a little OER for you there. Um, how to make online discussions work in your teaching. Five tips. 
Uh, we have another one, which is managing an online course, uh, discussion forums. Uh, this one's a little video, so if you don't want to read an article, you can uh, go through a short video uh, on YouTube. And um, the last one is actually a open access journal article. So if you're finding this all a little bit um, insubstantial, then you can uh, read deeper. You guys are academics. You love your research-based articles. Um, so please, uh, there's a couple of these uh, uh, research articles which go in a much deeper level. Promoting deep learning through project-based learning, a design problem. And so uh, our author there unpacks some of the issues involved. Again, these are all OERs. Uh, there's buttons to access them online. And you can see the Creative Commons licenses. Again, all of them allow you to access them and let me just check and uh, change them if necessary. All right, you might say, oh, but that's kind of very high level. And it was. It is an introduction, and we're trying to give you some ideas, seed some some ideas so that you can go forward. If you want to know more about these activities and how to actually build them properly and create them using these online tools, then we strongly advise you sign up for webinar three. Okay, know if learning is happening. We're going to investigate how to set activities, assignments, and tests and use them to track down student growth and learning. So, uh, yeah, we'll get a lot more practical. We'll sh show you some of the common pitfalls and um, help you become more of a, um, a practitioner, an online, an ERT practitioner in terms of um, setting activities and doing assessment. Which brings us to our fourth point. Let me just check my back room that they're happy with things. Okay, yeah. All right, so which brings us to the fourth point, which is the essential elements of ERT. Uh, number four, provide feedback and support. Okay, and again, we would say that you've got to appreciate the context which learning is now taking place. Um, remember that your students used to get most of their information about the course and the materials and so on from their peers. Uh, the whole network, a peer network, is an important part of how students cope with their academic program. And now suddenly that's been taken away from them. So they really are reliant now on this tenuous connection that you are setting up with your ERT. And um, the problem, often many people mention that online learning is is kind of the sexy thing, but it's actually a very difficult environment for the learner. They often feel isolated. There are many technical barriers to success. Um, and it only really works well if there's some type of support mechanism for them or the students are very much independent learners. And we know not all students are. So in fact, I would say a small percentage are independent I feel comfortable doing independent study. So having said that, then the link with faculty is essential. And here is where you're going to provide them some feedback. You're going to give them some support and let them feel that you are following them, that you are supporting them, that they are not in isolation, but they are still part of a big learning community. Um, so, all right, I'm still checking my back channel. Yes, no, they're still saying carry on. Um, the, how would you do that? Though? So how do you make sure that faculty is supporting and that you are supporting them? So one of the easy ways is to rather put up notices for the whole class. So instead of engaging them one by one, which can be quite trying, um, rather put up what I've called an office hours video. Normally when we're doing some type of online study, we say that our office is open, 
between, say, four in the afternoon and six in the evening. With my type of uh, learning communities, they tend to be adults and they're learning off, but uh, they are studying after work. So we normally have a daily office hours open uh, in the evening, but, but limited. Um, and then people can post questions all day, but um, there's, an ex there's an understanding that faculty will only answer during the two hours office hours. So we always make sure someone's on duty in the evening. However, after a week of engaging with all these queries during your office hours, it's a good idea then to address the whole class again. And this way, um, I would encourage you guys to use your phones and to put up a little video of you discussing some of the common issues that kept repeating themselves over and over and over again during the course of the week. And it doesn't have to be long, um, maybe eight minutes, 10 minutes. Uh, but one thing that they do like is to see you. They like to see that you're still there, that you are engaging with them and that you are thinking about them and so on. So I would say if you can, use your phone and uh, put together, it doesn't have to be super, super professional. Half the fun is that it, they can see that it's you in your house. You're also all rugged up in your lockdown situation. And uh, therefore they can uh, appreciate that you're going through a similar experience to them. And then during the video, you um, obviously unpack that week's problems. However, the responsibility does lie with faculty and you must put together some type of a support mechanism, but it makes sense to try and recreate the peer network that is now uh, missing. And some of them, some of the students will do this themselves, but if not, then you need to encourage them to put together such a network. And the obvious place to do these is in the, in the social media platforms. So um, again, a WhatsApp group. Uh, in my experience has been very useful uh, and therefore when by the time I get to answer a query the, someone in the class has already done it for me so that's usually quite nice um, so I would say try and put these together so a whatsapp group but you could also use facebook page or a facebook group um, the the issue with a facebook group of course is that it's very public so you can't really air your your laundry uh, <laughs> uh, in public and although there are these days uh, facilities to keep it as closed as possible uh, it is a very public environment so just keep that in mind a slightly different approach when you're using Facebook um, and then there are numerous other channels if you are using your institutional LMS for example then there's like a group mail system that you can use or um, a chat facility within the, the platform that you're using that the, that the peers access and talk to each other. So see if you can start thinking about how you might set up then this peer network so that they can support each other. Another item which is quite useful is a frequently answered questions page or resource. And again, the, the trick is not to feel that you have to do everything here. So um, your team could put together the first couple of questions and make sure that there is a suitable approved answer. But then you could get the students to actually do this for you as well. They could set questions and then they could answer each other's questions. And to do that, you would probably want some type of a collaborative uh, document whereby everyone has rights to edit. and um, this can be done if you're using an institutional LMS, you can use the wiki uh, facility. I know in Moodle they call it um, a wiki, um, but most LMSs have some type of a collaborative um, tool. Uh, but if you don't have that, then think of Google Docs. Um, the idea then is um, set up a document, make sure that there is access for the class, and you can start off by, from your experience, putting in the types of questions that are frequently asked and a response, and then ask students to set questions and find answers amongst themselves. But uh, the whole trick, of course, is to use 
a document which allows multiple people to edit. And then my fourth item here is, um, it's like they, the students want to know that you are watching what they're doing. Um, if you are uh, distant, then the, the students feel that you don't care and that you're not really engaged. So one easy way to uh, make sure that they know that you're watching what they're doing is to try and summarize readings and res respond to what students have said. So maybe set a reading, but then uh, a week later, go back to it and say, all right, uh, class, let's kind of summarize what are the main messages, what are the main points, and allow um, them to identify what they think are the main points. Or if it isn't forthcoming, then you identify what those main points are. Just to make sure that they uh, are aware that you are tracking their progress and understanding of the materials that they're going through. All right, so those are four simple little ways to provide feedback during the ERT sessions. There are multiple materials that you can, uh, tools that you can use. And um, again, we've put together a little basket of open educational resources which you can access and read. The first one is about how to make your own little videos. And You've got to get out of your minds now that you need a studio and lights and sound and all that type of thing. That's very old school now. Uh, most of us lecturers need to become guerrilla filmmakers. We need to be able to um, use our cell phones to put together um, an informative, engaging little video, uh, which we can then share with our students, either through the LMS or through some type of social media uh, group. And uh, there's a little video there for you to, uh, a little, tutorial for you to read through and take away. <clears throat> Pardon me. The second little resource we've got for you there is um, how to use social media effectively. And I quite like this video. This video um, is not all how wonderful it is. It's quite a lot in there which kind of alerts you to potential problems and issues. So again, another little good um, resource uh, about how to start accessing social media and using it if you can. And then again, I've got another open access um, uh, article for you to read. Uh, this obviously social media is, is of a lot of interest to researchers at the moment and how that intersects with education. So I've got a little um, one uh, open access article which you might find of interest. Okay, at this point, uh, we had planned for you guys to um, have a little discussion amongst yourselves and with the back channel, but because we um, just were overwhelmed by the numbers, um, I want you to think about this in your mind. Okay, so Andrew's just gone on a long tirade about um, all these items, about YouTube and Facebook and all these things, but have a think. Are there any communication tools that you could deploy immediately? Have a think. Is there something that you already use maybe with your family? Maybe you use it in a non-educational context which could now be harnessed to support your, your class. Again, keep in mind that not all students have access to great connectivity. So are there any like low tech ways that you might communicate and support your students? Don't discount email, for example. Okay, email is very right down there in terms of most people can access some type of static email with low on pictures, but with essential text. So could you use like an email group to communicate? Uh, 
Okay, I've got a query coming in a second. I'm just waiting to see what it is. Someone has got through. All right, here we go. The query is from Heidi. She says, I'm using Twitter and the university's LMS. I think that I have a good grasp on how to engage with my students and how to keep them engaged. My problem is, however, that I don't think much learning has taken place. Students have performed quite poorly in my online quizzes, although I'm only assessing theory to prepare them for the more formal assessments. How, to, how do I ensure better learning? Many thanks. All right. And I think this is a very common problem with ERT. Um, in fact, online learning generally is we often feel that our students lose rigor when they are now left alone. And to some extent, this is true, all right? That students think, oh no, this is hard. I therefore don't have to push as hard uh, to get through. I'm finding it um, a little bit overwhelming. Therefore, I'm not going to do much. And I would say that um, this is something we need to counter as faculty. All right. So uh, we need to impose on our students our expectation that it's business as usual, that um, um, they need to become tenacious. If there are problems, and there will be problems, they need to find creative ways around the problems. Heidi obviously found a creative way to get around the closed chat room, for example. Um, and, but at the same time, students are not going to be as involved if they don't feel engaged. So it goes back to what I said earlier. We need to design ERT lessons which are interesting, that are engaging, that seem to impact on the students' experiences past pre experiences. So I'm afraid there isn't a simple answer. It really needs means we need better designs uh, in terms of how our ERT lessons are put together. And if you think of your lectures in the past, you kind of knew when the students were engaged and when they were totally distracted, all right? And uh, you've got to remember that these are young people there are many things in their lives. They've got um, um, a peer network, which is probably more fun than you are. And therefore, we've got to find a way now to kind of package what we're teaching, but in an engaging way so that we can compete with um, these other distractions, for want of a better word. And so therefore, even with our lectures, we should be thinking about how do we make them more engaging if we, if we feel that many of our students are not fully engaged during those times. So it's a, it more of an education issue rather than an ERT uh, question. Um, what is nice about Heidi's comment is that she is trying to track them. She is using quizzes and she's um, a bit put out by how poor they are. So then the results are, how poor the results are. So um, again, maybe we need to make it so that there is some, there is some tension, that there is something that they need to accomplish in order to proceed. So maybe even put, don't just make them all formative assessments, maybe put in some term, <laughs> term marks, some, some summative assessments, hurdles along the way so to kind of gather their thoughts so that they're focused on the next thing and again sadly this works better for males than it does for females um, men kind of raise their game when they see there is um, uh, a barrier that needs to be overcome uh, whereas women tend to work very nicely throughout <laughs> those are generalizations but the um, i would say Yes, try and provide some tension along the way. It mustn't all just be totally relaxed and a holiday. All right, I don't know if that answered your question, Heidi. It's a good one. Um, and it's interesting that um, this is not unique 
Heidi's concern is not unique to the developing world. A lot of developed nations mention that online learning often has the same problem, that they don't feel students are totally engaged in it. So yes, try and make your, your, your lessons more engaged based on what I mentioned. Okay. Do you need more, more detail or more skill on how to communicate effectively? Oh, hang on, I've got another one. All right, before we go on, let me go back to my question page. Right, Ishmael Isaiah uh, says, what is the difference between open access and open book? All right, because I'm wearing my OER Africa hat, so please, um, they are very different, okay? Uh, in your minds, I want you to think of open as really what is open education and the, the general principles are we want as many people as possible to access and be successful in their in their studies in their education uh, we want it to be as flexible as possible we want it to uh, be as, uh, no barriers to entry and so on so when we look at all the opens and for example i've mentioned a few already today open access we, is normally used in terms of journal articles. So we talk of open access journals. So the thinking then is these are journals which you don't need to subscribe or your institution needs to subscribe to. They are freely available on the internet and can be accessed and read without any cost to the reader. Okay. Um, OER Africa is has just put together a an online tutorial about what is open access and um, how much you publish your research articles as open access. So we will put a link up for in the next webinar so you can access that. Um, so open access then is more for journals and research publishing. Open book, um, if it is an open textbook, okay, then that means it is a textbook which can be accessed without any cost that is distributed freely, that uh, many of the open textbooks allow you to adapt them and to change them uh, as you see best. And um, the, the nice thing about it is you don't have to, that you nor the students nor your institution has to pay lots of money for texts, textbooks. Many textbooks these days are astronomically expensive. And so this is a one way of allowing open education access to, for more students. If you mean open book as in an exam strategy, then obviously that's completely different. It means the question that has been set allows you to look at the uh, textbook during the exam time. The question obviously isn't a direct comprehension question. It's obviously a much more open-ended question and you might just need a couple of little references and terms uh, in your answer. So that would be another interpretation of the term open book. Okay, I hope I answered that question. Is there any more? All right, my back channel seems all right, so I'm going to push on. Okay. If you feel you need more uh, detail and or the skill to actually develop these communication tools and support tools, then you're going to Here's a punt for webinar four, a week on Friday, um, uh, where we will actually go into some more detail on how to make those decisions and how to actually do it. We will look at uh, WhatsApp and Facebook specifically in the technical section. Uh, all right. Okay, so um, any more questions? Uh, let me have a look at my mail. Maybe people are sending it that way. Let me have a quick look at my mail. And then we'll look at the uh, technical uh, section of today's program. Mail, mail, mail. Uh, it says, see the chat. Hang on. What's that?
All right, I'm just going for the one at the bottom because it's handy. How do you know the assignments or classwork and homework are not being done by imposters? All right. And um, the if you are, it's a good question. And this is one of the big concerns about online learning and especially online assessment. Um, the, the, and the answer is uh, you would need your, sorry, let me get this right. Uh, you, one of the ways you can do it is by making sure that you are using a learner management system, an LMS, which wants you, the students to be accredited into the system. All right, so that means there is there are some passwords and usernames to get in. If they are having someone sit next to them, um, then uh, and actually doing the assignment, then there's no way you can tell. All right, if you are using an online environment like a Google Classroom, there are a lot more ways to hack into the system. So it's all according how important the uh, the assignment is. If it's a summative assessment, some type of a summative assessment, then it's very important. And then you need to rethink carefully about what is the assignment and how can we make sure that everyone's answer would be unique and that our students can be identified by what they're doing. In the LMS I'm used to, uh, I use Moodle a lot, then there's a, a facility whereby you can put the student's picture up on the screen. So if you are doing your summative assessment, but there are some type of invigilation going on, then the invigilator can check that the photograph on the screen is the same person that's sitting in front of the machine. But um, a purely online uh, summative assessment means there's a lot more going on. So for example, if you go on Coursera, for example, they want you to accredit who you are. And so before, you can even start, they want you to type up a little paragraph in um, uh, as a, uh, almost like a fingerprint. They want to know how do you type. And so with Coursera, some of their courses, which are offered for accreditation, then they match the typing done by the student during the exam with the little typing uh, uh, port uh, portfolio, uh, profile that they have for that student. So um, you, there are other biometric ways you can do it. For example, uh, some of them now want your fingerprint, uh, a bit like the new uh, smartphones, which are using fingerprint to access, and even a few of them now are using face recognition. So these are problems which have not been resolved nicely yet, but I can see in the, in the medium term that assessment will become a lot more secure online. But for ERT, I'm afraid, you're going to have to just set questions which will allow you to recognize by the response from the uh, student that that is most likely from that student. Okay, sorry, that's a long way of answering that question. Uh, we've got another one here. I use, this is from Kintani, I use WhatsApp groups of 10. Unfortunately, I don't get to see what they talk about, but each WhatsApp group has a group leader. I only speak to group leaders, okay? And um, I think that's an interesting practice. Um, I quite like the idea of making them more private. Students are more likely to be honest and speak what's on their mind in small groups, but I'm a bit of a busybody. I like to know what's going on. So I tend to be in these groups and I am in, hundreds <laughs> of WhatsApp groups and it does get a bit trying sometimes. I have to turn it off just so I can have a respite. Um, but uh, I do like that strategy. I think it, it puts a lot of agency onto the students themselves. And obviously if there's a leader, the leader can raise issues to you if there's problems with the group. Uh, Dr. Annette Bossoff asks, uh, get them involved by adding badges through Edmodo which is a free portal. And I see Telegram becomes popular. One of my students suggested that. All right. And again, in one of the later um, uh, webinars, we're going to investigate a whole load of these different tools and how you might use them. The idea of badges that Dr. Bossoff has mentioned is 
an interesting one. Uh, most LMSs now allow you to offer badges. So we were talking about how do we keep our students engaged? That was one of the earlier questions. And maybe you want to use badges. So if they collect a full set of badges, these are electronic badges, uh, which are awarded on completion of various tasks, then there might be some type of a reward or an incentive, or perhaps it's even a requirement for the course. So badges is something you could uh, investigate to keep people engaged. All right. Okay, are there any more? Let me just go up a little bit, see if I can find one or two more. All right, no, we'll leave that. It looks fine. Okay, cool. Let me go back to the, the notes. All right, so we're in the last 25 minutes now. And we've talked at a very high level. Some of those questions were really good. They're more operational questions, which means, okay, I accept what you're saying in principle, but how do I do that? Which is great. Um, so this is more of the doing section. We didn't really know who you were. So we had to kind of come up with some ideas for the demonstration. And um, uh, if you've got specific interests, then let me know. And, and then we can always work them into one of the subsequent webinars. But today, we are going to look at how to make your PowerPoint a bit more sexy. All right. We mentioned that lots of text is a bit of a, a turnoff for some learners. And um, what's more, reading on the screen is never ideal. It's always more difficult to read the screen than it is to read a book or a paper. And therefore, um, we've got to kind of think of ways to reduce the amount of text, but uh, still get our main message across. So we're going to look at PowerPoint. A lot of you use PowerPoint for your lecture notes. So how can we make it even more engaging than perhaps it is already? Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to look at putting graphics in. A lot of us do that already, but we've got to cover it. So we'll look at that and I'll show you three different ways. Uh, how do you put video into your PowerPoint? We'll show you that. Um, quite nice, because we were talking earlier about how do you make um, uh, offer support? And we said, have an online presence, let people know that you're around. So therefore, inserting your own voice into your PowerPoint is quite nice. And what's more, we often say that uh, you shouldn't put too much text in. So maybe you want to expand or expound one of your points. So therefore, you could use the audio for that. And then... Some of you uh, might find that what you do is a piece of software, perhaps. Maybe you're an economist and you're interested in the statistical pa packages and you want to capture what you're doing on the screen. Then you can use uh, screen capture. PowerPoint allows you to do that as well. Okay, here we go. The first one is inserting graphics. Let's see if I can get this to go. A quick and easy way to make your notes more appealing is to insert some graphics, some visual elements into your notes. And for most of us who use PowerPoint, this is a basic step, but I'll go over it again quickly. In the text box, you'll notice there are some little prompts directly in the middle. Click the first icon on the second row, and this automatically opens up access to any resources that are on your laptop. Navigate to have an appropriate graphic and click on insert. The box disappears but is replaced by the graphical image. I'm going to reverse a little bit. I'm going to push Control Z to go back to where we were. And now consider a second, probably more interesting way to add graphics to your notes. If you look at the second icon in the second row, this one says, insert online graphics. This window appears and it already gives you access to Microsoft's free image library. And you can choose a category. I'll look at money, for example, and it'll then provide you with any options that it has in terms of money. Now, most of this money looks American, but let's just go with one of these items. We will choose this one. 
Uh, notice, however, that in the top left-hand corner there is a filter mechanism, and you can now say that you're only interested in Creative Commons or open licensed materials. Uh, this is a good way to escape any fuss or problems related to copyright issues. So I normally make sure that that tick is in place. And then click Insert. And voila, we have now got the image embedded in our notes. The challenge with the PowerPoint library is that it is all very stock looking. Um, and we might be needing something more specific. Say, for example, you're an economist, then you might need a chart which is just not covered by the library. So the easiest way to find more specific images is to use images.google.com, which is Google's image search. Navigate to images.google. Dot com and then type in what you're looking for so say for example we're looking for a supply and demand chart there we go supply and demand curve would work and we've now got the power of Google search engine looking for specific images um, the problem though with the results that you get originally is that this includes everything that Google can find and some of it could be copyrighted. So there is a filter to help us find materials that we can uh, reuse without asking for permission. Click on Tools, and under Usage Rights, you have some options which are pointing specifically at open licensed materials. So I'm going to say Labeled for Reuse with Modification. This is nice and broad. It gives me a lot of options of what I can do. And now I can see what's available. And the one that I'm looking for is more to do with a very simple or classic supply and demand. So I'm going to go for this item here. Um, and I can right click this image and go save picture as. I will save it to my laptop. and then return to my PowerPoint. All right, so now I want to uh, insert a graphic. There is no text box to use this time, so I must do it the, uh, using the menu. So go insert a picture from this device. I'm interested in this image here. Select it and say insert. And now I have it in my notes. Okay, right. Let me have a look at the chat. Is there what's going on in there? Um, give me a second while I get it up. All right. Are there any about PowerPoint? Okay, not specifically about PowerPoint, but these are good questions. So before we push on. With the PowerPoint, I'll just uh, engage with some of these. I am using Moodle as my LMS with my students. I have implemented most of the strategies mentioned by Andrew to enable interaction and active participation. However, students do not participate. Most complaints are with network connections. Assist with other strategies. It is really frustrating if they do not participate. All right. So, Willem, or William, um, yes, I'm afraid this is something we need to um, make very clear to our students, that the fact that it is online does not mean that it's in any way inferior to what we would expect when they were face-to-face. -face. Um, if, if they are shirking, then we need to shake them up. However, if, they, if their concerns are real, if they really are um, struggling with connectivity, then our strategies need to be very low bandwidth and very simple. So earlier I mentioned uh, email. Maybe all these other nice things that have been demonstrated today, uh, the video and um, 
the audio and simulations and so on uh, aren't going to cut it because if the, your community is very low bandwidth then we need to respond in a way that allows them to still access materials so email or offering text documents is not very sexy but it does get the information across and then i also mentioned earlier that there maybe we need to have some hurdles they need to jump through and um, being isolated means a lot of them just slack off so then we need to say no it's an online activity but it's for marks or it is for uh, part of your term marks so i would say um, we've got to change their expectations but we need to be real so um, we need to provide them with materials and acti activities that can be done within the context in which they live and have to study. All right. Um, we've got a question here from Bonadventure. What can we do in teaching practical sessions or laboratory testing? All right. Now we're going to cover this in the, in the next one in more detail. Um, practicals and uh, lab sessions are extremely difficult to do effectively online they can be done but you need to be really organized and um, prepared so maybe under ERT conditions you might decide no I'd rather do as much theory now and then we will do the ERTs where we can get back into class um, uh, that's something that we will discuss in the next webinar is which sections of your curriculum lend themselves to ERT and which ones are difficult. However, if you have to do lab work and practical sessions, then we're going to have to introduce video somehow. All right, so we can't give them the real experience and therefore we're going to have to simulate what the experience would be like. Video is the easiest way to do it. We record what normally happens in the lab and we get in real close so they can see in, in detail. Um, the problem though is um, even a simulate, no matter how good a simulation is, it is not as good as the student doing it for themselves. All right, so when we were doing the electricians course recently for in South Africa for Department of Higher Education and Training, we tried to provide them with little kits of equipment that um, they could then use remotely uh, when they were going through the video. So we would show them in the video what to do and then expect them to actually do the practical session using the materials in the kit. Uh, but again, you need to be organized and you need a little bit of a budget if you're going to make sure that everyone has access to a little kit. Um, yeah, so um, it can be done, but um, it's not as good as the real thing. Um, and if you are going to do it, you need to be prepared and organized. So, yeah, sorry, no quick and easy uh, uh, answer for that one. And finally, I think it's better to sample the student's opinion uh, or what technology they feel comfortable with uh, to deploy email. Are the students used to the environment? And this is a big problem for ERT is that many of our students, have, just as you're not ready, they're not ready either. And um, so uh, rather, I think this is a very good uh, suggestion is look for things that people are familiar with and build up slowly from there. So if they are only used to social media or only used to email, start there and then slowly build up, introducing new little tools as you discover them and find them useful. All right, um, what else we got? Right, let's just go push on a little bit with our presentation. Um, the next one is on video. I'm going to play the video because we are slowly running out of time. In fact, Matt, not so slowly. One way to break the amount of text in your notes would be to provide some of the information using video. There are two ways to put video into your PowerPoint slides. The first one would be to click the item in the second row with the little video screen and go and locate the video somewhere on your laptop. But it's more likely that you want to use a YouTube video that exists out there on the internet and it is possible to embed those videos into your notes. To do this you need to open your browser 
you need to navigate to www.youtube.com and then do a search for the video that you are interested in. If I am a maths teacher, for example, I might be looking for some information about calculus. So we'll do a calculus search and YouTube provides us with a whole load of videos that are available on their platform. However, we want to keep uh, copyright problems to a minimum. So we're going to use the filter facility and click on Creative Commons. And now it sifts through all the results and provides only those ones which have a Creative Commons license. I'm going to go for the first item. And let's say, for example, that we decide that this one is appropriate. What you do is you right click the video and you can choose copy video URL. Then you return to your PowerPoint presentation. And this time you go to insert, insert a video, video online. And then it asks you to type in the URL. Well, we've copied it, so we'll paste it in. Control V is paste and insert. And now we can position it and resize it if necessary. And it is embedded into the PowerPoint. The only catch is for it to play on the student's device, they will need an internet connection. One way to break the All right. That's the second little tip. And um, so video from a YouTube is doable. Again, though, like some of those comments that we heard previously, um, if your students live in a low, um, low bandwidth environment, then YouTube's videos might not be the answer because um, they would obviously have to pay for the bandwidth to view them. And um, the, uh, and they might not even play nicely. They might uh, be, be broken um, because of the low bandwidth. So keep that in mind. You need to, or you will talk about it in more detail in the next webinar. But how do you um, select uh, tools and um, activities that and resources that are appropriate to the environment in which the students uh, live and study? All right. Let me have a quick look. Are there any more queries? Before we look at the next one. All right, yes, we've got a request from Dennis. Um, he says, please cover how we can as assess accounting and tax, etc., in your session on assessments. Uh, method marks are so critical in these assessments, so the final answer is less important and multiple choice questions cannot help with this. Any tips will be welcome. All right, we can do that. Uh, not specifically accountancy and tax, but those type of subjects which require um, some type of analysis. So you need to see if they can actually do the doing. How would you uh, uh, engage with that online? All right, so yes, we can do that. Uh, any other queries? All right, let's go back to your one. Or we'll do one more. I've actually got two, but we'll do one. I think this one's a great one. Uh, how to make your PowerPoint uh, more personal by using voice. In this next segment, we're going to insert your voice into your PowerPoint slide. Why would you do this? Well, good PowerPoint design means you haven't put too much text on the screen. Maybe they're bullet points or maybe they are key phrases. And therefore, they do need to be expanded on and explained in full. And an audio would be a good way to do this. To do that, though, it's pretty straightforward. Look at the top menu, select Insert. The ribbon changes, and on the extreme right-hand side, you'll see there's a section called Audio. So click on Audio. There are two options. If you've recorded the audio with your phone, for example, and have now added the file to the PC, then or the laptop, then you can uh, simply upload the file into the document. But it's more likely you want to use the mic on the laptop to record your audio. So select record 
audio. A little dialog box appears. It asks, do you want to give it a name? So you can. And you'll notice that there are some controls directly below. The little red circle is your record button. So now you can click it and begin the recording. Insert your own voice. Select Insert from the top menu. Select Audio from the right-hand side of the... When you have completed your recording, the other button that is now colored is the Stop button. So you can push the Stop button and you'll notice then that recording has ceased and but there is a little play button so you can click on the play button and it should play it back to you so you can hear if you like it once you do like it you can say okay you'll now notice that there is a little gray speaker icon and you can position this anywhere you like on your screen the controls that the student will use are at the bottom here but you now have two further options you can decide that the Audio will only play if the student clicks the icon, or you can say, no, I want it to run continuously. To do that, you right click it. You will notice that you have some additional tools now at the top. One is style, select style. And if you want it to play automatically, choose play in the background. All right, okay, stopped a little abruptly. Um, so that's again it's a nice way of keeping a presence alive online by inserting your voice into your powerpoint uh, lecture notes and you can also expand on what you've put in point form on the screen let's have a we've got, we're down to a few minutes now so let me just see if there's any more queries in the chat yes we've got uh from jimmy uh he's all the way from uganda and he says, assessment and evaluation of online learning is a challenge. Do you have some innovative ways on how this could be conducted? Uh, how can I be sure that students are answering assignments themselves? Okay, so we have mentioned earlier about how do you know that the real student is behind there? And um, for simple, uh, free uh, online uh, tools, that's obviously a problem because there is no way to authenticate who is actually sitting at the machine. However, when we go to summative assessment, there are some strategies that we can use. We can um, use invigilation. We can um, uh, even use biometric uh, devices these days on some of the, the tools. Um, assessment and evaluation will be covered in more detail in the third webinar. So please make sure, Jimmy, that you're there and we'll go into a lot more detail about how you might do this all right that's my last one um sorry i can't see who's in the thing all right, let's leave it all right i'm going to have to sum up now because we're down to the last few minutes in the uh, uh, powerpoint there is also how to capture your screen it's a few minutes uh, so if you feel that you are trying to present some a piece of software, perhaps it's a piece of software that your students need, it's accounting software or statistical software, and you want to take them through a procedure, a bit like I did now for PowerPoint, then PowerPoint actually has the tools to do that. So have a look at that one as well. In this yes. Okay. All right. So let's sum up then. What were we trying to achieve today? So we said there were basically four elements that should be in place for effective learning to happen. We said you need to be very careful about um, selecting your materials. Don't overwhelm them. Don't give them too much. Make sure they are core essential readings. And then we said, um, ideally, even those materials should be chunked or segmented into smaller pieces if possible. We said that rather than just handing out resources, you should try find a way to contextualize their study. So why are they going through all these materials? And we mentioned things like set some questions so that they can use it as a lens when they're going through the materials to fully appreciate uh, what the materials are about. Or set a real world problem or set a hook. You might remember we mentioned those. And then we said students must not be passive. If you just hand out stuff, there's no ways that you uh, can expect them to uh, be really uh, 
knowledgeable about your subject. So create activities that run in parallel with all your materials or that are a result of what they've studied in the materials. And finally, we've mentioned that you should start investigating ways to provide feedback so that they don't become disengaged, that they are actually uh, aware that you are following them, that you are setting them tasks that they are expected to perform uh, even in this, uh, these difficult times. So those were our four um, uh, essential elements. There were also a whole load of OERs that I mentioned today uh, related to the, what we've covered this afternoon. So um, please go into the classroom. There's the link and there is the code. And we've laid them all out. You can collect them up in there, including this presentation is also in there. So if you wanna look at those videos again on PowerPoint or that one that we missed out on um, uh, inserting uh, screen captures into your PowerPoint, then it's in there as well. You can access it from there. All right. I'll have one more check of the, of the chat. No, I haven't got anything else. All right. Um, all, right. Is, uh, uh, all right, then I think that's been a session. That was a marathon for you to sit there for an hour and a half. I hope you're still there, or well, some of you. Um, and again, uh, I'd like to invite you all to come through to the next webinar on Thursday, where we are going to look at how to uh, make your selections in terms of the um, in, in terms make your selections in terms of materials activities and tools okay thank you very much and um, hope to see you again thank you very much Andrew for an excellent presentation thank you to our wonderful participants we will certainly be in touch with you uh, via email if you have any questions or are unable to get access to the resources that we will share please feel free to get back to us thank you for being a wonderful audience enjoy the rest of your day have a Thanks. good afternoon yeah bye ciao ciao